Hello, and welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm Tara Parker Pope, editor of the Wellbeing Desk here at The Post. Today, my guest is podcaster and best selling author Gretchen Rubin, whose new book is called Life in Five Senses How Exploring the Senses Got Me Out of My Head and Into the World. Gretchen, welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm so happy to be talking to you. Hello. Yeah, this is a treat. You know, I've known you for a while and you are kind of my go to person when I have a happiness emergency. You know, when I need a, a helpful tip for readers to uh, get them through a tough week. So I'm excited to talk to you. So tell me about this yeah. new book. Like, what's its origin story? You know, you you go from the happiness, you know, the world of happiness to the five senses. What was your what was your uh, the moment that made you think that a book about five senses is what we all needed right now? Well, it was a very ordinary moment. Um, I had a stubborn case of pink eye. So I went to the eye doctor and um, as I was leaving very casually, like wear sunscreen or drink enough water, he said to me, well, be, be sure to come back for your regular checkup because as you know, you're more at risk of losing your vision. And I said, wait, what are you talking about? I didn't know this. And it turns out that because I'm very nearsighted, I'm more at risk for having a detached retina. And he said that could affect my vision. And as it happened, I had a friend who had recently lost some vision from a detached retina. So that felt very real to me. So I walk out onto the street. I live in New York City. So I was getting ready to walk home. And I realized I was taking all of this for granted. Um, of course, I knew that at any moment I could lose anything. Um, and I also knew that I would have a rich, meaningful life, even if I did lose a sense or some. And yet it, I, I, I realized that I just wasn't appreciating the richness of the world around me. And in that moment, it was like every knob in my head just got dialed up to maximum. And I could see everything with crystal clarity. I could hear every sound. I could smell every smell and smell in New York City. It was this, this intense, almost psychedelic experience the whole time that I was walking home. And that showed me I'd been thinking about happiness for all these years, but I knew that something was missing. I mean, there was some element that I wasn't tapping into. And that walk, that realization and that walk showed me that what I was missing was this deep connection with my five senses and that that was the way forward. I had to connect with the world and with other people and with myself through my five senses. So you obviously think about this in terms, you know, your framework is, has happiness and your really life's work. But is there is there more here than just happiness? Is 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 there something more you got out of it, um, exploring the senses in a more uh, you know deep way? Well, I, what I found is that with almost any aim that you're trying to achieve, there's a way to approach it through the five senses. And what's nice about the five senses is it gives you something kind of concrete to think about. Because a lot of times we have these transcendent aims like. I want to connect more deeply with the people around me, or I want to spark my creativity, or I want to increase my focus, or I want to evoke memories of my own life, um, or uh, I want, you know, I'm, I'm feeling very sluggish and low energy. I want to like boost my energy so that I can, you know, be more active in the world. And with just about any aim, I, there was a way to think about how to use the five senses to achieve that aim. And again, it was very concrete. Like it's a way to take transcendent and abstract ideals and figure out how to make them real in our own life, you know, on an average day without spending a lot of time, energy or money. These are things that the average person can do. Now, are you talking about sort of mindfulness, you know, being present in the moment and being aware of your senses? Does that play into what you're talking about? Do you think this is maybe a more accessible way for people to think about mindfulness? Yeah, absolutely. And I say that as somebody who has tried and failed with meditation a couple of times. Meditation is a tool that does not work for me. But mindfulness, being present in the moment, I think is something that many of us aim for and, and almost crave. And one really wonderful thing about the senses is that you experience them in the moment. You cannot bookmark them. You cannot uh, you know, save them for later. Um, you have to experience them right here, right now. And with some of the senses, you can't even glut yourself on them. Um, one of my favorite senses is the sense of smell. And one thing about the sense of smell is you can appreciate it right this moment, but you can't even keep experiencing it because of odor fatigue. It will fade out of your awareness. So it's something that you can only appreciate in the moment. Um, it's very ephemeral. Um, so I think it is a very good way for people who are trying to be very present in the moment. It's a great it's a great way to connect 
Um, and again, that maybe feels more concrete and maybe a little bit more playful um, than other things that people do to connect with their five senses, say like a five, four, three, two, one meditation, uh, which many people love and find very useful. Um, this is kind of a, a little bit, I think, more playful. It reminds me of of a sort of mindful walk where you go walk through Central Park and you maybe look at a rock or you see you notice the grass is greener than you realized. And it's the walk you've taken every day. But if you just tune in. But how do you yeah. get yourself to that moment where you're you're tuning into your senses? Well, that's 100 percent the uh, the challenge, which is how do you remember to do it? And so I think one of the things is just to realize that you're trying to do it and to bring it uppermost in your mind. So like one thing that I did was to keep a five senses journal where every day, you know, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, I would write down just one notable thing. It didn't have to be the best thing. It was just something notable. And what happens is that by writing these down, it got me much more aware as I was going through my day, like, oh, I hear the sound of church bells downtown. I'm sure I've heard them a hundred times without noticing them by, by, by trying to keep a record of it, you know, whenever we do that, then it, when we're, when we're remarking on something in that way, it helps us to notice it. So that was a great exercise. It also sort of a function as a gratitude journal. Um, I was also kind of annoyed by trying to keep a gratitude journal when I tried it, but this ended up being a kind of gratitude journal to the world. Um, but look, one other thing that you can do is try to identify your neglected sense. I have a quiz. If you go to GretchenRubin.com slash quiz, you can take a quiz that will tell you your neglected sense. This is a really useful thing to know because this is low hanging fruit. This is something where you probably aren't uh, experimenting with it or seeking new experiences or using it to connect with other people or um, having fun with it, turning it to it for comfort or pleasure. So that's low hanging fruit. And by and by sort of deliberately saying, OK, like my ne most neglected sense is taste. Um, by really saying, okay, I know that I tend to neglect this sense. Let me really go out of my way to seek out experiences and to really, you know, appreciate the experiences that I am having. Um, that helps me to be more mindful in the moment um, and to those things that, that you know, I was neglecting. Um, it's a very popular sense with a lot of people, but it's my neglected sense. And um, so just being aware of that helped me to um, be more mindful of that sense. I took the quiz today. It was fun. And I think that I, di I didn't get my results yet, but I think that my neglected sense was touch. But, you know, ever since my dog died, I don't have the same, you know, cuddles and, you know, and I, it really got me thinking about, you know, I'm, I'm planning to get another dog. So I think that will help a lot. But yeah, uh, yeah so I, I thought that was a really fun quiz and it was pretty interesting to think even that quiz sort of helped me tune in to the things I was doing or not doing, right? Um, being a, the awareness around me. Um, you have a really interesting example in your book about daily visits. So your daily visit was the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which we don't mm -hmm. all have access to, but I want to hear about your daily visit and how we can take that experience that you had and, and apply it to our own lives. Well, I've always been very interested in repetition and how experience changes with repetition and familiarity and how things change very gradually over time. I mean, to me, the and as you say, I'm like incredibly fortunate that I have the time and the freedom to visit and I live within walking distance of the Met. Um, but the Met represented to me like the treasure trove of the world that I wasn't seeking out, even though it was available to me. And so I thought, oh, OK, I want to visit every day and see how it changes over time as an experience, what I can see, hear, taste, touch, smell there um, and what I learn about myself. And when I started doing this, I thought this was very idiosyncratic, this desire to do something every day. But I've learned since I started talking about it that this is this is a, something that many people share. I think some people love novelty and they wouldn't want to restrict themselves to a daily visit to the same place. But many people are very compelled by this idea. So maybe they say take the same walk with their the very same walk with their dog every day, or they do the exact same hike and take a picture of, of the river at sunrise every day. A guy told me that he visits his like big chain drugstore every day. And I'm like, there's a lot going on in a big chain drugstore. I would love to go to a big chain drugstore every day. And, and people who do forest bathing will often return to the sit, same sit spot over and over. I think for a certain kind of person, it's a very attractive kind of aim, which is to experience something over and over and see how it changes. Excuse me. <clears throat> no problem. I found it interesting, though, because in the world of happiness research and 
you know, novelty, you know, gives you a dopamine boost and you get very yeah. excited. And, and so one of the things people often say is try new things, go take a pottery class, go to an amusement park. And now you're telling us to uh, have the same experience consistently and just be more mindful while we're doing it. Did you think about that sort of surprise? Yes, absolutely, because you're exactly right. All the research shows that people are made happier by novel novel situations, experiences, even something like going to a new restaurant. Absolutely, that's true. The brain seeks novelty, but it also seeks familiarity because familiarity is easier. So one of the things is, is by doing the same thing every day, I, I saw nuance. I started to see subtle distinctions because... Um, because I went all the time, I was like, oh, they're swapping the paintings much more than I realized. Or I noticed how on a wet day, it smelled differently than on a hot summer day. Um, because since I was going over and over, I was seeing novelty within this sameness, sort of like, but a more subtle layer of novelty. Also, I had the ability to be bored. There's a lot of research showing that, you know, when our minds are kind of like on the loose, when we have a little bit of boredom, that's when we start to create unexpected associations. We see kind of um, surprising juxtapositions. And that absolutely happened to me. It's like with familiarity, just to kind of keep myself interested. Sometimes I would have these big insights when I was walking around the Met, much more so than I did in other parts of my day. I think for some people, this might be the shower um, or like when you're like lying in bed in the morning before you get up, this kind of open time when our mind is at recess, um, when there's and so I think for me, this was the right balance of novelty and familiarity, because you're right, they both offer us something in terms of happiness and um, creativity, um, but, but not the same thing, obviously. So can we talk about the five senses and sort of go through each one? And can you give us advice about, you know, how do we, let's start with sight. You know, what can I do to sort of tune into sight more? What, what's some advice you have for that sense? Well, a really fun thing to do is to look for things that are overlooked. Um, like a great thing is just like the logos around us. There are so many fascinating, imaginative logos with things like Tostitos or Hershey's or FedEx, um, the eight and your eight of diamonds, deck of cards, they're all hidden. Um, and it's just, you know, when you start looking for things, really appreciating them, um, if you uh, if you've ever gone to a foreign country and you've gone to like a drugstore or a grocery store and you see everything so vividly because it's all new and you really notice the packaging, try to do that in your own life. Like, what do things really look like? Um, go to a bookstore, go to a hardware store and really look hard at things and you will notice that there's a lot of sophistication. It's like, would I have used this color scheme? Um, why are all these products brown? Like, what's going on there? What are they trying to signal me? When we look for what's overlooked, a lot of times we see things um, that we didn't expect to see, uh, and it really uh, makes the world far richer. So that's really fun. So what about, this one I worry a little bit about, hearing, because I think we've all been in a situation where we meet someone, she says, hi, my name is Gretchen, and we talk, and at the end of the conversation, I realize I've completely forgotten the name. So tell me about yes. hearing and how we can tune into that that sense a little better. Well, you're exactly right. One of the most important things we do with our sense of hearing is we listen to other people and uh, and in conversation. So one of the big things I worked on in that area was to become a better listener. Now, the phenomenon you're talking about is very common because we're so preoccupied when we meet a new person that the name uh, just slips out of your mind. So one thing to do is just to repeat it because then that helps you. Um, one thing I often do is say like, oh, I, I I keep wanting to call you Catherine, and I know that's not right. So that's kind of like suggesting that it's the tip of the tongue. Um, but uh, but with listening generally, like you want to do things like, and, and if you're just meeting somebody for the first time and you want to show that you really are engaging with them, you're really listening, you want to turn and face them um, so that they see that they have your full attention. Um, you want to nod, say, uh-huh, you do not want to multitask. Look, we've all seen people try to surreptitiously be on their devices. We all know when that's happening. Um, uh, if somebody's telling you something important, rephrase it so that they understand that you're really listening and you really are trying to track. Uh, I realized that one of the things I did um, that made me a worse listener is that when people would tell me, uh, especially about something that was a problem, and especially if, the, if it started to feel kind of emotional and fraught or fraught, I realized that one of the things I did was I would immediately suggest a book to read. Like I got a book to recommend for any situation a person might find themselves in. And I would say, oh, you've got to read this, you've got to read this. 
And I realized that actually that's not that helpful. I can email them later with a book recommendation, but in the moment, it was really a way to kind of steer the conversation away from what was feeling very fraught. And that's not helpful. If somebody wants to talk about a subject that's difficult, you know, I want to stay in the moment with them and listening. And um, a lot of times the most important thing is to just stop talking, um, which is which is harder than it sounds. <laughs> Although in your defense, I would think that getting a book recommendation from you would be fun and would be welcome. I wouldn't mind oh, that at good. all. <laughs> okay, that's good. Yeah, I can send a follow-up email that has it, though, instead of like that taking it the moment. Sense. But I'm glad to hear that. Thank you. Yeah. So you already mentioned sense of smell. You find that quite enjoyable. Tell me just a little bit more about that. You know, sense of smell is funny because it's also one that you can't necessarily turn off, right? If it's an unpleasant smell, you're kind of stuck with it, right? Yeah. Well, you are stuck with it. Um, but one of the things about the sense of smell is that w it will fade out if it's a very persistent smell that you're that you're that you're experiencing. Um, one of the things that that is, I think we're sort of all dimly aware of. It's really surprising uh, when you actually confront it, which is you cannot smell your home the way a visitor smells it or a guest smells it, because when a smell is very familiar, the brain does not bring that to your attention. Um, so if you work in a coffee shop every day, you won't experience the coffee shop smell. But a person like who's just walking by and walks in, they will smell that coffee very strongly. So if you've ever been to somebody's house where you're like, whoa, why does it smell so strongly of air freshener in here? Um, and the people who live there seem completely oblivious to it. It's because they really are not experiencing it because our brains are acting as difference detectors because that's opportunity or danger. And if something is very familiar, then it's not flagged for us. Because that way, like, let's say there was the smell of fire, you would be able to smell that because it would be new and unexpected. Um, and this is just sort of an uncanny thing to realize, which is two people can walk into a room and to one of them, the smell could be almost overpowering and the other one might not even perceive it at all. Um, and so, yeah, so the sense of smell is fascinating. It's invisible. It's unexpected. You know, um, the others, you could just be walking down the street and all of a sudden you're overwhelmed with uh, the smell of pine tree even when you didn't expect it. And that makes it, I feel like almost a kind of a magical smell, a sense in a way. Yes, and you are in New York. So there's quite a lot of uh, difference, quite a variety of smells, right? Good and We've bad. got a lot of smells. It, We've got a lot of smells. It's one of the great things about New York City though, I would say. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so let's talk about taste. Now, did you say that taste was maybe one of your weaker senses? Yeah, it was my neglected Something sense. And so, so I found a lot of ways to tap into the sense of uh, taste. I mean, some were just kind of very fun. Um, I uh, experienced the magic of ketchup. Um, uh, you know, ketchup is this ubiquitous food. We, you know, 97% of Americans have ketchup in, uh, in their kitchens. Um, and so it's very easy to take it for granted. It's the secret ingredient in a lot of foods, very popular foods. And it, the reason that it's so powerful is that it has the five basic tastes all in one item, sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and umami. That's very hard to do. And so you see, what, and if you really just taste a little bit of it, you realize it's complex. It's got an aftertaste. It's like a taste explosion in your mouth. It's clear why it's so popular, but I had never thought anything about ketchup. So that was just one little thing. But another thing is I realized how I could use my sense of taste to connect with other people beyond just like, let's go out to dinner together. Um, so I had a taste party with some friends where we we um, tried different varieties of like apples, potato chips, cho uh, chocolate, and just talked about our different responses. And it was just, it was so fun. We all had a lot to say. We were laughing. We were reminiscing. We started talking about the candy that we ate as kids, all kinds of things that we had never, I'd never talked to my friends about before. It felt so warm and so playful and intimate. Um, and this kind of taste variety is a great thing. You could do it with your, your coworkers. You could do it with a family because like a three-year-old and a 83-year-old would both have something to say and could ex could participate equally. Um, so I found l ways to connect through taste um, and to enjoy taste that had never occurred to me when I was neglecting it. You know, it's interesting. Tell me a little more about this relationship between taste and memories and experiences. Um, does, does taste trigger memories for us maybe more than other senses? Well, you know, people will often argue that one sense is the biggest one, like smell brings it all back. But I, to me, I got to say, looking at all of them, 
Um, I think they're all really powerful. I mean, I think, and it might be different for different people, like what you're more tuned into. Um, but, you know, listening to the music uh, that, that was your favorite song in high school or the signature smell of uh, the signature perfume of your grandmother or um, the, yeah, like the taste of like the, your favorite junk food that your parents would never buy you when you were a kid that you always desperately wanted. Um Looking at something, one of the things I did for uh, to evoke memories using sight is I went on to uh, websites to see if I could find photographs of houses and apartments that I've lived in, you know, many, many years ago. And it brought back so many memories to see these photographs of like my grandparents' house that I haven't I haven't been in in years. It all came back. So I think all of the senses are very powerful at evoking memories. And often we have memories that we've forgotten that we have. We remember something, but we kind of forgot that we remembered it because we never call for that memory. And by saying to your, like I did a taste timeline of like the big tastes of different sections of my life, it brought back so many memories. And then I use that to reminisce with my sister because my, my taste memories of childhood or her taste memories of childhood. And we had so much fun talking about it. It was things that I'd forgotten that I remembered, but by trying to remember, well, what were the tastes of that time? It really helped to surface all kinds of memories um, that I hadn't thought about in years. So I think all of the senses can be used to evoke memories. Yeah, I can relate. At Thanksgiving, uh, we made this green jello mold thing <laughs> that my mother yeah. used to make. And what was fascinating was not just the stories of the adults in the room, but of the grandkids and all the things they remembered about that food and, and family. And it was really lovely. And so I think it'll be a new tradition to make this just because you know, it makes us think of our mom and it makes us think of great family memories. So I, I think the the link between taste and food and just all the senses and memories is it's maybe kind of an underrated way to tap into some feelings of happiness, I would say. Would you well, agree? Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Because when you feel connected to your past, it just it gives you this sense of continuity in your life. And it also helps you feel connected to other people. Um, one of the things that it, kind of along the same lines and using all five senses is um, to do a five senses portrait of someone. So I did a five senses portrait of my husband. So with each of the five senses, I wrote down five of my favorite or most distinctive associations or memories for him, uh, of him with that. And made this very kind of concrete portrait um, of, of my husband, Jamie. So that was very fun and I like, gave it to him as a gift. But then somebody told me that she had done it for someone who had died because she really wanted to hang on to those memories and also to be able to convey a very concrete sense of this, you know, beloved uh, family member who had died to children who were too young to remember him. They were too, you know, so she felt like it was a way to really hang on to those memories, which might seem very vivid, you know, when the, you know, right when the person's fresh in your mind, but as the years go by, it, it's really very precious to have like these 25 things that really evoke, you know, this very, very vivid sense of the person. Uh, it's a very satisfying thing to create. It's not hard to create. It takes some thought, but it's kind of easy to write it down. And then it's really something that conjures up all these memories that are so vivid. So we have one more sense to talk about, sense of touch. What do you want us to know about touch and how we can tune into that? Well, I, I thought it was one of my most neglected senses, and I turned out, it turns out I'm wildly focused on touch, and I didn't even know it. That was one of the things that was surprising about the book was how little I knew about my own preferences. But you mentioned something that is so valuable. We need that contact. We need human contact, but also cats and dogs. Like That is a wonderful way to get that feeling of of life and that feeling of connection. It's I think anyone who has a pet really understands how valuable that is. And one of the things that surprised me is how often even just like touching an object can help us to feel grounded and calmer. And I think we're all familiar with things like fidget spinners or therapy dough or weighted blankets. I found that for me, it's a pen. When I feel like anxious, like I, I'm going to a party where I don't know anyone or I'm you know be backstage before I'm giving a big talk, I find that if I just hold a pen, it helps me to feel calmer. There's something about, I'm not going to write anything down. It, I just want to hold it in my hand. And I've talked to people who hold mugs or water bottles or clipboards or even something like a stone that just feels right in the hand. There's something about that touching something, holding something that can help us feel calmer um, when we're feeling like we're, we're, you know, we're being overwhelmed by anxiety. I think that's actually really useful advice. Now, we have a question from a reader, and I don't think we can have a conversation with you without talking more about happiness and the happiness project. Um, this reader, Darlene Herrings, 
of North Carolina ask, how do you keep the happiness project alive when so many sad things are happening in our own backyard almost daily? I think it's a really timely question. And I'm curious, you know, the news is tough and every day there's something sad. Um, what's your advice for people for coping with that daily sadness when they're trying to live a happy life? Well, it, absolutely. And, and, and to take it even a step further, I think some people feel that it's even wrong um, or, or morally um, unjustified. You know, how can I think about my own happiness in a world that's so full of suffering and injustice? It doesn't it doesn't feel morally appropriate to think about my own individual happiness. But what the research shows is that happier people are more interested in the problems of the world and they're more interested um, in the problems of the people around them. They uh, donate more time. They give away more money. They're more likely to vote. They have healthier habits. They make better team members and better leaders. They're more likely to help out when someone needs like a neighbor or their community needs a hand. Um, they, uh, they have the emotional wherewithal to turn outward and to think about the problems of other people and the problems of the world. And when we're less happy, it's a lot easier to become defensive and isolated and preoccupied with our own problems and to really feel like we need to shut out the problems of the world because we just are feeling so overwhelmed with our with our own unhappiness. So I think that by taking the time to think about and 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 the energy as well to think about our own happiness. It's not that it's an either or that if I like if I'm if I'm thinking about other people, I can't think about myself. It's more that they work together and that by, uh, you know, it's like that cliche um, about the oxygen mask, you know, put on your own oxygen mask first and then help others. It's a cliche because it's true. And that by taking the time to think about our own happiness, our own energy, um, that really actually helps us to turn outward. Um, to think about the pain of the world and what actions we can take in our own lives to try to, um, you know, uh, remedy that. I think it's great advice. That's a great note to um, end on. It's been such a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for your work on The Happiness Project. Thank you for this new book, Life in Five Senses. And Gretchen Rubin, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thanks for joining us on Washington Post Live. Thanks so much. I enjoyed it tremendously. Thanks, everyone.